Hi, I'm Jonas Lund, and I'm gonna give a brief artist talk, a walking artist talk in the Swedish forest. I have a paper here with some questions from the Daijun Biennial. I'm gonna try and answer. And the truth is, this is the third time I'm making this video because I had some technical difficulties. And I know I've had some really good uh, answers to the questions before, so I just hope I'll be able to do them again. Anyways, here we go. First, ha have a look. It's very beautiful around here. Although there used to be a lot more trees around here. They cut them down for some reason. I'm not really sure why. So, uh, as I said, my name is Jonas Lund. I'm originally from Sweden, where I am right now but I'm based in Amsterdam and Berlin. As an artist, I make a lot of work about uh, power, distribution of agency power, like systems of control, network systems of control and power. Who gets to speak for whom and in what context? All in relation to technology or sort of technological innovation and what's the impact on society from that. And I think this point makes a lot of sense from a sort of a background in programming. It makes a lot of sense to sort of try and subvert or figure out the rules of how things operate. Because programming is basically that. You just write rules. Like you have a set of rules that perform over time. Let me take a sit there. Whoa! There's a branch. So you have a set of rules that perform over time. It's basically just a procedural execution of rules. Right? So you have like an if else statement. It's like, if this is true, do that. And if this is true, do that. And I think um, in that sense, uh, it makes sense that my work deals with that. I'm also very interested in this. I mean, it's also about trying to figure out if I can reclaim some of this uh, power for myself. right? or like agency or whatever. So let's have a look at this piece of paper. I don't know, I said it was gonna go on a walk, but I need a little break. So I'm gonna have a little break. So we have a bunch of questions on this paper. Uh, I'm gonna try and answer some. My bachelor was in photography at the Rittfeldt Academy in Amsterdam. Uh, then I was deeply involved in photography. As I went into programming as a sort of main medium, uh, that got quickly replaced. And then I, I f programming at the time felt like a superpower compared to photography. Like photography was like you take a picture, programming you determine rules for how the world operates. Right? So it, it was like a massive sort of increase in artistic agency, let's say, or like artistic power. You know? like what I can do. And I make a lot of different works, like paintings, installations, performances, uh, video, photography, websites, anything. But all of it, like I make like paintings, they also have programming as a sort of core foundation, either as material production or as a like surrounding over, overarching theme or as a production methodology. And I mean, like it's uh, like such a powerful tool for artistic production that it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's well, it has uh, for me. I think it's a couple of different things. I think most of what I what I'm thinking for myself when I make work is to make visible certain behaviors, structures, systemic um, complications, complexities. Make it visible. Right? Make it visible to someone who didn't really know this before, or make it visible in another type of context. I think that's for me the most important thing about artistic production, to explore certain topics, figure out if there's a way to subvert how things operate or subvert it for myself, subvert it for someone else, shift the context. But I also think like in this day and age, something that goes quite often overlooked or not actually paid too much attention to is the artist's role is also to provide relief or well, not relief, but like, it can be enough to just provide entertainment, right? Something that makes you smile, something that like is enjoyable, something that makes you think in a different way. I think that's all like very relevant sort of artistic endeavors.
it has changed but not all that much i have like for better or worse i don't really re like to repeat myself when it comes to artistic production i mean i know people some some artists make sort of the same idea over and over again for their whole career which i totally could have done too but i didn't because i somehow already know right so like you make one thing and then i kind of already know what it will be so then i'm much more interested in trying to make something new which is really a pro and con kind of situation because sometimes it's like you have to like outsmart yourself constantly all the time but it's quite uh, yeah i don't know it means that my practice changes quite a lot i mean it's starting to rain but that's no problem because we don't mind a bit of rain as long as it doesn't rain too much we keep on going uh let's see next question i do but it's top secret stay tuned let's say i think it's enough for an artistic intro i can also mention that i have a website jonaslund.com on this website there's a lot of text a lot of documentation and even videos of artist talks so if you want to find out more about my other work that's the best place to do it To be honest, not really. Man, I'm, it's not my first time sort of remote installing artwork. I think also because the team at Dayun Bayano is so like on top of things, it's quite easy to do it. Like we have multiple Zoom meetings with all the sort of walkthroughs and stuff. So that worked really well. So nothing to complain about that. Let's see if there's more questions about this one. What's your most embarrassing moments <laughs> during preparation of the band? I'm sorry, there was no embarrassing moments. I don't know. I don't think I've been embarrassed in terms of artistic production or installation for a long time. So, but I'm very curious to hear if other artists were embarrassed. I don't know. It would be good. <laughs> it would be good to know. I think in terms of this question, wait. Sorry for it's a bit messy. This artist art, but that's okay. I mean, I'm I'm like generally a pretty big skeptic about this. I think in terms of tooling, toolkits, surely it already has quite a big impact, at least at the most sort of uh, avant-garde of this like art and tech scene, let's say. But so when it comes to like image production, video production, sound production, it's already pretty like impressive what you can accomplish. Like from deep fakes or whatever i think that's like super useful and practical whether it will lead to good works that's a totally different question but it might enable or speed up the potential production capabilities which is great in terms of changing the art market i don't see it like i don't think i don't think it's going to change much in terms of that it's such a rigorous strict very hierarchical power structure that i don't see it changing much the big blue chip galleries are going to stay the big blue chip galleries i already use quite some ai tools in my artistic production just because it makes things go faster or easier where you get different types of possibilities you know so like in the case of uh, the piece in the biennial which uh, we added korean translations because it's largely a text-based piece that translation is powered by a, like a Google's neural network translating tool. So in a way, it's like it's a perfect example of different types of tool tooling we use. So the work that's on view is called Significant Other, which is the typical description of, of your most important partner, right? So like that would be the classic description of your your wife, your husband, whatever. It's like your significant other, your most important person, except like next to yourself. Right? And it's a piece that exists in a pair, which one could guess from the title. And they're usually installed, the pairs, they look identical, but they're usually installed in two different institutions. 
So it was shown at the Vienna Biennial 2019. Then one was installed in the Museum of Applied Arts and the other at the Kunsthalle Wien. And then once they're installed, they create a sort of dialogue with each other. It's not necessarily a comparison directly, but it's a sort of back and forth dialogue. From um, inside the piece, there's uh, cameras that are observing the viewers. Like it's observing all the visitors to the institution. And it's using a sort of quite, I mean, it's using a quite rudimentary, basic, not necessarily basic, but how best to describe it? Quite a, uh, we, we switch. It's using a neural network for analyzing facial expression to try and guess or understand the emotional, uh, emotional situation of the viewer. So currently these neural networks aren't the most advanced. I mean, I'm updating, every time the piece is shown, I update the, the neural network for up to the latest, let's say emotional detection neural network. So it can uh, analyze and guess six different human emotions, it's like happiness, surprise, fear, anger, disgust, and neutral. Analyzing all the visitors, and then it makes comparisons between the two different locations. So it would say like, you are 20% more happy here, or you are 5% more fearful here. And then it's the idea is somewhere that by being confronted with your significant other, realizing that something else is happening over there, you might think or reflect about what's happening here. So it's a sort of back and forth, sort of push and pull situation. So that's one aspect of the piece. The other is it also produces sort of statements, uh, kind of generated statements about all relate, relating to the different type of dystopic, dystopic surveillance capitalistic uh, idea of the world. Uh, to provide a sort of alternative narrative to the experience of looking at this piece or potentially predicting something in the future of what all this like invasion of our facial privacy or invasion of our general privacy might lead to. And I think and like as an overarching sort of experience or think about the consequences of what it means Basically, because I had a talk uh, the other week with a show in China, in Beijing, where facial surveillance is profound, right? You're basically analyzed and surveilled wherever you go. So like your emotional complexity or your emotional state gets uh, boiled down to these six different categories, then used to surveil you, to track you, to to increase the engagement of your behavior, to adjust your behavior in society. Not only to adjust, but also to punish like deviant behavior, let's say. And I think it's quite, um, we're starting to see, let's say, consequences of all these different aspects in society with this incessant, incessant uh, obsession, which, opt which means optimizing for engagement. You look at Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, whatever. It's like the uh, s smartest people, some of the smartest people on the planet are spending all their time trying to figure out how to get people to click more ads or to spend more time on their device. It's not even so much about ads anymore. It's just time, like, optimized for time, optimized for engagement. And I think that is the sort of basis for for how we deal with each other, how we operate together, it's a really bad basis for it. So in a way, the piece tries to provide a sort of alternative narrative in a way to this, or trying to predict or, yeah, trying to explore where it might lead and also make you reflect upon the consequences of all the different types of invasions of your existence, of your being. And it provides this as a sort of text-based narrative, also as a counter to 
a lot of different uh, like AI based work, which very often ends in the visual sphere. I think the text based is sort of the most basic, straight, clean kind of um, solution to it. It's, it feels neutral, which while it's very much not neutral. And the significant other pieces get sort of a voice or personality and entity, which is this alternative narrative text lines. Because machines don't have a sort of behavior on their own. They don't exist as entities. They are controlled and programmed by humans. So it's like, it's the same as there is no like unbiased algorithm and algorithms don't have necessarily lives on their own. They are all just executing rules programmed by people, uh, primarily white dudes in California when it comes to the Western part of the world. So what's the relationship between non-participant or like non-informed participants in this technological world versus the people who program the algorithms and program the automated processes, I would say it's one of a massive power asymmetry, right? Which is the classic sort of critique of social media or all the big tech companies that they basically know everything about us, while we would know hardly anything about them. We don't know how their algorithms operate. So usually they don't really know how their algorithms operate. So then we have a total asymmetry of agency and influence. They know everything about us. We know nothing about them. They have all behavioral surplus, which is what uh, Suboff talks about in surveillance capitalism, the age of surveillance capitalism. They have all the behavioral surplus to predict our behavior. And all we can do is like, it's very difficult to counter that. We have we become like passive recipients of this nudging of our behavior. Uh, I don't really know. Yeah, I don't really know what to do about that. I mean, like, surely one the first step is to be informed that this is happening, so you have a better, a better informed resistance towards the behavioral sort of influence. I think also like Douglas Rushkov, which is like a media critic scholar, I come back to this statement a lot. He wrote a book in 2010, I think, called Program or Be Programmed, which more suggesting that either you, it doesn't really tell you that you should learn how to program, rather it tells you you should inform yourself about how you are being programmed, how all these processes, influences, algorithms, machine learning, AI situations in society is influencing and trying to predict your behavior. And the better you understand how you're susceptible to this influence, the easier it is for you to, not easier even, it's like, the more you understand it, the more you're aware of it, you're better guarded against it. Doesn't mean you're immune, for sure not, because it's a bit like a placebo, right? Like, even if you know it's a placebo, it will still work. Even if you know it's like, wow, look, son. Even if you know it's like, um, uh, you're, even if you know you're being influenced by the algorithms, you'll still be influenced by the algorithms. But it's a worthwhile endeavor. That the more you are, the more you understand this, the better. When it comes to this relationship between human and automated process, it's very, it's a very unfair relationship. It is not on equal footing. It is not in an equal engagement. Yeah. It's very complicated, I would say. But the better you are, the better you understand that it's an asymmetry. Whoa, it's slippery. The more you understand it's an asymmetry, the better, I think. For me, at least, that's how it works. Let's see. I think we're almost at the last question on this paper. Let's see. We have a look. Now we can go home and have some coffee. That would be nice.
but in general, my advice to anyone who goes to any exhibition is to try to keep an open mind and then see uh, what one might learn and understand. Maybe part of this is like also in the program of be programmed narrative is that you can learn how to program through the Daijun Biennial. Anyways, uh, thank you so much for your attention and for looking. I say it again, if you need, uh, if you want to uh, see more of my work, you can find it on my website. Maybe there will be a link in the video. There's also a bunch of artist talks and lectures there that are a bit more uh, rigid, let's say. Not a walking talk, but a sitting talk with a projector and a presentation. Although I have to say, the forest is super nice. This is a good counter to power asymmetries in the technological world. Anyway, thanks so much. Ciao.